pretty much everybody in the world, I should think, now has taken a view on what they think they know about COVID in particular, about viral infections, about viral spread. But are those things really true or are they a mixture of truth and myth? You know, what are they? The virus announced itself in a rush of panic. So we're saying we want to kill 200,000 people in the UK. Lockdowns were never a public health measure that had been considered before uh, they were introduced in response to this epidemic. It's because it's really a way of avoiding blame. If you say that you've done something, if you can show that you've done something to try and avoid something, you can claim that you've done all you could. Much of what we've seen being done sort of doesn't make much sense medically or pathologically to my mind. Or put it another way, if you're going to do an experiment on entire populations of people, you ought to be pretty sure that the treatment that you're going to give the population, the measures that you're going to introduce, are going to be less harmful than the disease itself. My name is Dr John Lee. Uh, I trained in medicine at University College London and subsequently I trained in pathology, which is the study of disease. Uh, a lot of people think pathology is all about autopsies and, and dead things, but in fact pathology is all about the living. Before this year I used to believe that we lived in a liberal democracy uh, and that we lived in a scientific age when rational discussion was actually what mainly led uh, wide government policy. But unfortunately, this last year has really shaken my faith in that. Not only have we summarily had most of our inalienable freedoms removed from us, but rational discussion uh, and calm assessment of facts and figures seems to have gone out of the window. I'm retired. I'm free to speak out as I would see fit. One of the reasons why I started writing about COVID at the beginning of the lockdown was that I was motivated to prevent harm. I mean, as a doctor, one of the overriding medical principles is the Hippocratic principle, which dates back to 400 BC odd, um, and it's first do no harm. You should be sure that what you're doing to them is going to cause a better outcome for that patient than doing nothing at all. And it's not an old fashioned medical principle, it's absolutely key to being a doctor. And yet it was one of the first casualties of the response to COVID because the government decided to prescribe a treatment for the entire country with no risk benefit analysis of that treatment whatsoever. Many people have the impression of this epidemic that they have because of the initial framing. Uh, the initial framing was one of panic. The authorities were panicked. Many professionals were panicked by the idea of a very serious virulent disease coming out of China. We haven't really had a revision of it. The authorities, in my opinion, have painted themselves into a corner by their responses to COVID um, and they really have been forced to stick to the narrative that they invented to start with. You know when a terrible pandemic is happening because there are bodies in the streets, basically. It kills you if you're old and infirm, but it kills you if you're young and fit and healthy, and it kills you if you're a child with the, the strongest immune system of your life. That is not the case with COVID. People thought that this was another highly virulent epidemic that was going to kill a large number of people. The original numbers that were coming out of Wuhan were something like 3.5% in terms of the number of people who died. So that would mean that for every 100 people who caught the disease, roughly three and a half people would die, or seven people out of 200. Um, of course, this actually turned out to be a great overestimate. There's a thing called ascertainment bias. At the beginning of an epidemic, you identify the most serious cases first because they're the ones who turn up in hospitals and in ITUs. But of course, they are the far end of the spectrum in terms of severity. So what normally happens is as an epidemic progresses and more and more people catch the disease, it turns out that the disease is not as severe as people thought it was going to be. And so the infection fatality rate falls and that's exactly what's happened with COVID. All other diseases from COVID, uh, if you average them all together, cause a certain life expectancy at the moment in our country, which is about 81 years. The average age of death from COVID is 82 years. So it's a good year higher than the average age of death from all causes. What that really means is COVID predominantly kills elderly people with low life expectancy already because of their age and predominantly people who have pre-existing conditions of one type or another, which would already be life-limiting in their own right. So really in that sense, COVID is no different 
from any other disease. Elderly people are more susceptible to almost all diseases, injury, infection, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, you name it. As we get older, our bodies get weaker and we become more susceptible to all diseases. COVID is now an endemic virus. That means it's a virus that circulates in the human population. And actually our immune systems are used to dealing with viruses like this. Antibodies to viruses are the acute, the early phase response to viruses. And the antibodies come and go. The long-term immunity to COVID comes through our T cells, which are living cells that find cells infected by viruses and kill those cells to stop the viral reproduction in our bodies. Now T cell tests are harder to do than antibody tests because antibody tests can be done on a plate with chemicals, but T cell tests require living cells to make the test. Therefore they're harder to do. When these tests were done last year, last May, June, it was found that 40 to 60% of people in our populations already had T cell responses that were effective against cells infected with coronavirus. That implies that there is indeed quite a high level of cross-reactive immunity in our bodies to coronavirus. Very often during the pandemic, we've been told that the reason why we must do certain things is because the health service is on the verge of collapse. But unfortunately, when you look at what that message really means, it's actually something a bit more sinister than just a straightforward fact. The government, right from the beginning of the pandemic, has used fear as a way of ensuring higher compliance with the measures introduced than, of other, than would have otherwise been the case. If you think about it, our health service and many health services around the world are always very busy during the winter because of winter peaks of disease. So almost on the verge of collapse, in a way, is a rebranding of the term busy. Uh, notice that health services have never actually collapsed. If health services had collapsed, it would remove the compelling factor that we should do what we're told because it would have already gone too far. If health services were doing fine, obviously then we also might be more willing to bend the rules. But when they're on the verge of collapse, we're compelled to do what we're told because we might be able to pull the situation back. It's very interesting, isn't it, how we've always heard that health services might be on the verge of collapse, but there haven't been any headlines about the ones that have been doing well or the ones that have dealt with it uh, without any trouble. When you can't see a threat, you don't really know where it is or how bad it is, and you don't really know when it's gone away. And a virus is another invisible threat. And one of the hallmarks of COVID, of course, is that it's not a clinically diagnosable disease because it overlaps in its symptomatology with many other respiratory infections, which we're much more used to being around. So the only way in which we can diagnose COVID is with a test. We're completely reliant on the accuracy of tests to actually have a handle on COVID because we can't see it. Therefore, it's an invisible threat and we respond to it in a, in a stereotypical way. Pandemic planning was thrown out of the window in favor of something, lockdowns, that had been explicitly rejected as a method of managing pandemics previously being considered. And the main reason why it switched to doing the second approach was because they believed that there was a group of people in society who were asymptomatic, that is, showed no symptoms of disease, like me now perhaps, and yet were somehow incubating the disease and therefore could spread it to other people, vulnerable people. That's the only justification for locking down a whole society. Yet the evidence for this asymptomatic spread is very weak. There are in fact only three ways in which you can have a positive test for coronavirus and be asymptomatic. One is that you're actually incubating the virus. So I'm asymptomatic now, but in two days time, I'm gonna become very ill and I'm gonna have the virus. As of now, that's a very small number of people because of the success of the vaccination program. The second way in which you can have a positive test, but no, have no symptoms, is that you've had a false positive test. So the test hasn't worked properly and it's shown a positive result. So it's suggested that you're going, you've got the disease, but it's just wrong, you haven't got the disease. That's a moderate number of people when you test on a population-sized basis. The third way in which you can actually test positive but not have the disease is what we used to call being immune to the disease. And if that sounds strange, let me just explain. When a virus gets into your body, your body can't know that the virus is there until it's infected one or two cells and started to replicate. Once it starts doing that, your body notices the virus is there and then the immune system moves into action and it sits on the virus. But at that point, before the immune system fully sits on the virus and makes it go away, at that point, if you do a PCR test on that person, you can detect the virus. And the reason for this is the PCR test 
It's called polymerase chain reaction, but it's an amplification test. What it does is it multiplies the amount of viral material there by a huge number, either 2 to the power of 25 or 2 to the power of 30. That is an absolutely vast multiplication number. So in other words, when you have a very tiny amount of virus present in just a few cells, you can still detect it by PCR. Now, in the pre-COVID era, we would have said that those people were immune to the disease because, A, we wouldn't have known that they've got it because they've got no symptoms. And the only way you could even detect the virus in those people is by doing this massive amplification of the viral material. In the COVID era, those have been called positive tests and they've been equated with cases. Now, a case is normally somebody who has symptoms. It's not normally somebody who's completely healthy. So what we've done by confusing positive tests with cases is basically class a huge number of people who are immune to the disease as having the disease. That's a massive misconception. And of course, it's now even bigger that a large number of the population have been vaccinated. So an awful lot of the positive tests and the positive cases that we now seem to be detecting are not actually cases of disease at all. They're evidence of the success of both our own immune systems, the spread of the virus within the population and the vaccination programme. So when a, a survey was done to ask people in the country how many people they thought had died of COVID, the average response was 10%. They thought that one in 10 of the entire population of the country had died of COVID. And if that was true, six and a half million people would have died of COVID. So you can see how far off people's perceptions are from the reality of the actual official death figure, which is 126,000. Now that number itself can't be taken at face value and we can come back to explain why that is in a moment. But another figure that's often been quoted is the excess death figure. So one figure for excess deaths over the last year is that there have been 80,000 extra deaths uh, during 2020 compared to the five-year average. But when you dig down into that, you have to understand, first of all, the context of that 80,000 figure. Normally, in Great Britain, in uh, a year, about 550,000 people die. So 80,000 deaths is less than a sixth of the normal deaths that occur in a year. Then you have to understand that the five-year average for deaths in Britain is actually been below for example, the 10 or the 15 year averages for deaths in Britain. So we were coming from a low baseline and in a way that flatters the number of people who've died uh, in Britain of COVID. I mean, another way of looking at that is there were a lot of very elderly, frail people who hadn't died in the preceding five years who were waiting for the next disease to carry them off, if you like. And that sounds maybe a heartless thing to say, but unfortunately that is part of the human condition. We do have a limited lifespan. We are all going to die of something. So if you've got to 86 or 87, you've done fantastically well, but if a nasty new virus comes, you're going to be particularly susceptible to that. And the final thing to say about excess deaths is that one of the assumptions also made about the excess deaths is that they're all COVID deaths. But in fact, when you analyse the figures and go into the figures in more depth again, quite a lot of the excess deaths are due to the effects of lockdown, the effects of poor access to healthcare during lockdown and many other lockdown related features. I think one of the deficits there's been in the public debate is giving people the handles by which to think about what's been happening. So it seems to me that there are three things we need to think about when we're looking at any of these numbers. And these can be broken down into under three uh, basic headings. One is that you can't understand the numbers that are being quoted, either about the infection rate or the number of cases or the number of deaths. You can't understand those numbers without context. So when you're told that 10 people have died today of COVID or 500 people have died today of COVID, that doesn't really make any sense unless you understand that that's 10 or 500 people out of the 1,500 people who die every single day or out of the 550,000 people who die every year in Great Britain. The second thing is what's cause and what's effect. The assumption that has been made in a lot of the presentations that, that have been widely aired on television is that when we do something, when we take a management approach to a disease, that has an effect. So we do lockdown, that's the cause, and the effect is that the disease goes away. And yet, in fact, when you look at the viral curves around the world, very often the viral curves have been declining before lockdowns have been introduced. And then the third thing that one needs to think about in terms of 
analysing these figures is cost and benefit. So the cost, for example, of lockdowns are the vast economic cost, the vast effects on people's health in many, many different ways. The benefits might be, if it were true, that it stopped the disease spreading and therefore saved tens or hundreds of thousands of lives as a result of COVID. That cost-benefit analysis was never done before lockdowns were introduced. It still hasn't been rigorously done by governments, as far as I'm aware, to this day. But when you look at the numbers and try and do the cost-benefit analysis, it's pretty clear that not only did the lockdowns not have that much effect on slowing the spread of disease, but the costs that they have in terms of other health effects, other direct health effects on people, quite possibly outweigh uh, the damage that was going to be done and has been done by COVID. A good example of a fact that's become very well known to everybody during the last year but which needs deconstruction is the cumulative death toll. So it's currently reached about 127,000 uh, for the UK. But that number cannot be taken at face value and there are a number of reasons for that. And bear with me while I try and deconstruct it with you. So first of all, the 127,000 number actually adds together two separate peaks. Normally in the country, we get a winter peak of deaths of respiratory infections, and that's a normal feature of uh, respiratory infections every year that we get. Now, the COVID peak was a bit late last year because it was a new virus. It happened in March, April. Uh, and then we've had another one this year. Now, we've never before added together two peaks because we record one winter's peak, we then record the next winter's peak, we then record a subsequent winter's peak. But for COVID, we've added together last winter's and this winter's peak. The only reason I can understand for doing that is it gives a big number which is more newsworthy and from the government's points of view makes the virus seem more serious than it would otherwise be and therefore encourages compliance. If we did the same thing for influenza over previous years, we would get a number in the millions. So that's not something we've ever done before. And to properly compare the significance of COVID with other respiratory infections, we should look at the winter peaks as things on their own, not as a cumulative total. One of the, the hidden aspects of, of this epidemic and its management, it seems to me, is the way that it's being driven by something called the precautionary principle. And this is something that isn't widely understood in the, amongst the general public, at least in this country, but it has become embedded in the political management of diseases and other health scares. And the precautionary principle basically says that if there seems to be a potential harm to human health, you shouldn't wait until all the scientific data is in demonstrating that harm to health before you take action to prevent the harms. But of course, if you don't know scientifically that harms are really being caused in a certain way or by a certain mechanism, then it's actually a dangerous principle because it encourages politicians and public health doctors to take widespread intrusive actions on the basis of something that may not be true and without properly assessing the effects of those very actions themselves. And in fact, this last year, what we've seen is the fruition of that principle on a huge scale. One of the ways in which the precautionary principle has exaggerated the response to COVID is because it's based on worst case scenario planning. So when SAGE, the uh, Specialist Advisory Group on Emergencies, is asked to give the government answers to their questions, they're asked to explain what the worst case scenario would be. But of course, worst case scenario planning isn't a way that we ever normally live our lives. I mean, if we worked on the worst case scenario, we'd never drive a car, we'd never catch an aeroplane, we'd never eat, we'd never get out of bed. It's not that you shouldn't consider worst case scenarios, but they're just one of many scenarios that you should consider when you're proposing a response to something. A good example of where the precautionary principle is, is not neutral was seen near the beginning of the epidemic with care homes. The government decided to empty out NHS hospitals for the expected surge of seriously ill patients that they were sure were going to come into the health service hospitals. And so they moved a lot of frail elderly patients out of health service hospitals into care homes. And in so doing, they caused an epidemic of coronavirus in care homes amongst the very group of people they were claiming by their actions to protect. They've been prevented from having their relatives with them. That means they've lost their most vocal advocates for the right kind of care. And if you take away advocacy from older people, they die. Those are people who've, in our country, in our system, have paid taxes their entire life to support and to be enabled to have access to the National Health Service when they need health care. And the time in most people's lives when you need most health care is when you become older and frailer and suffer from many different diseases. And yet those people were prevented, in, in fact, exhorted not to access the NHS unless they absolutely had to. And what that resulted in was 
a substantial increase in the number of people dying at home. Um, that can't be regarded as a, as a neutral effect of the policy. The fact is people died at home because they weren't accessing healthcare. Not only in the acute phase of things like heart attacks, but actually things like cancer care. So I was an NHS cancer lead for over 12 years. And one of the things we spent an awful lot of time developing was cancer care pathways, because that has better outcomes for those patients in terms of treating cancer. Um, I actually had a, a, an example in my family. My, my father developed blood in his urine right at the beginning of lockdown. And instead of actually being treated within a two to six week period, he had to wait four months. And that particular anecdotal example will have been repeated tens of thousands of times across the country. One of the most shocking things to my mind about the way the epidemic has been handled is the way, is the way we've dealt with children. Uh, normally, as a society, we are very concerned to make sure that our children are safe, to make sure that we look after them even more carefully than we look after any other groups in society. And yet, for the COVID epidemic, children have been asked to live their lives in ways which are totally abnormal for a disease which essentially virtually doesn't affect them. A few children with serious pre-existing conditions have died of COVID, but if you look at the overall numbers, the risk to children is minuscule, and yet they've had their lives completely disrupted, essentially, by COVID. They've had their normal social interactions, their normal uh, peer social interactions, their interactions with the wider world, vastly curtailed for something which wasn't going to affect them. So I really feel it's been a, a you know, an awful mess and I, and I think it's very sad that our health service which in years gone by has really been a, a service which we could all be proud of has reduced itself to really a, not a very good level of functioning during this period. Well do, do the control measures that have been introduced to combat the virus work? I mean that's obviously a, 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 a key question and the three main things that have been introduced have been widespread lockdowns, mask wearing and social distancing. Can that work? Different guidelines have had different views on this. Some parts of the world have said one metre, some parts have said two metres. And early on in the epidemic, a story was invented to explain why this should work. The droplets that you breathe out are of a certain size, and it was claimed that uh, if you were further than two metres away from the nearest person, it would give that time for those droplets to sort of fall to earth and you wouldn't breathe them in and therefore wouldn't catch the virus. This is almost wholly a made up story. Yes, we do breathe out droplets when we breathe out or speak or sing or do any of these other activities, but those droplets being very small evaporate very quickly and what you get left is much smaller than uh, a droplet size. Um, but the, the real reason why it, the story doesn't work is a failure of imagination to understand how small a virus really is. When you're breathing out, if you have a, a cold for example, a common cold, you're breathing out about 10 million virus particles per breath. That's an awful lot of virus particles and these are very, very small indeed. They're, they're of the order of a thousandth of a thousandth of a millimetre. So that's, you know, they're, they're nanometre sized particles. So these particles get into the air and they circulate around the air. And frankly, if you're walking two metres behind someone else in a supermarket, do you really believe that because they're wearing a mask and breathing in and out and the air is going in and out by the side of the mask, that you're not going to be breathing in huge numbers of the same air molecules and the same air particles that those people have been breathing in. In fact, when you look at the scientific evidence, there's no real world data that shows that social distancing has any effect at all. Now, the same really applies to masks and lockdowns. Masks have been claimed to not protect the wearer, but to protect other people because they catch your droplets. But the same reasoning applies. The droplets dry out, you breathe in and out dust flakes, viruses go into the air. And yes, if you're highly infectious, it may retard the spread of those droplets a little bit. But in fact, the only real world study that's been done that I'm aware of on mask wearing, whether it has any effect, was done in Denmark and showed essentially no significant effect. And similarly with lockdowns, there is no real world evidence that lockdowns affect viral spread. So in fact, what you see is a scatter diagram of severity versus viral infection. And in fact, there's no correlation between lockdown severity and viral spread. Um, and unfortunately, in a situation that we've had with COVID, where essentially an awful lot of money has been thrown at studies uh, that uh, will investigate the disease, um, unfortunately, there isn't scientifically much mileage in finding negative results. So people want to know that they can do something that will have an effect. One of the problems with assessing the uh, evidence and the data is the quality of the scientific data that the various arguments are based on.
And unfortunately, one of the things that happened very early on in the epidemic was that in the name of speed, scientific peer review was suspended. Now, scientific peer review, whereby other scientists look at and criticise a given study, is the guarantee of quality in scientific work. So if you suspend scientific peer review, what you end up with is an awful lot of papers published which you don't know about the quality of what they're saying. Tell us about the value of wearing face masks. You see face masks around the place. Is there any point to that? If a healthcare professional hasn't advised you to wear a face mask, it's usually quite a bad idea. People tend to leave them on. Uh, they contaminate the, the face mask and then wipe it over something. So it's really not a good idea and doesn't help. What's interesting about this clip is it shows the Prime Minister talking candidly before the political narrative had become established. So they were free to actually talk about a range of options and to think about a range of ways of doing things which have subsequently essentially become censored and lost from the public debate. Um, I think a lot of the things that they were saying then were actually quite sensible and would have been the right way to do things. But of course we got hijacked onto a different narrative and the really bad thing about what's happened is that we've not been able to properly then discuss other narratives since the government's narrative became fully established and that hasn't been a help and it hasn't helped us manage the epidemic. Throughout my career as a doctor in the health service, and I, I was a consultant for 21 years um, and worked in the health service for over 30 years, um, doctors have been frustrated in, in many specialties, and including my specialty, by being told continuously that there's not enough funding to do this, that or the next thing for the health service. Um, what's shocked me over the last year is that almost infinite funding has become suddenly available for things that are totally ridiculous. Over £12 billion was suddenly found available for a test and trace system, which it was perfectly clear from first principles could never work to control or sensibly or even have any influence on the virus. And now we're being told that maybe a hundred billion pounds will be found for double testing the entire population every week, when actually there's no need for that because we've all been vaccinated. It's such a frustration, having worked in the health service for my entire career, to find that things that I was told couldn't possibly be done, now can be done, but they're being done for the wrong things. Test and trace seems like a straightforward way to control an epidemic. The idea is you test people for the disease, if they've got the disease, you then trace their contacts, and that allows you to isolate all those people, and that stops them spreading the disease to other people. Well, that clearly works very well for some diseases. Smallpox would be an example where it worked very well because the disease is clinically diagnosable um, and it, it's easy to contain the disease. It doesn't spread very easily from one person to the next if you stop them touching each other. The same for Ebola. Ebola was spread by bodily secretions and if you stop people touching each other, the transmission of the disease stops. But for other diseases, it doesn't really work very well at all because, first of all, the viruses spread around themselves independent of contact between people. Secondly, because not all the people who've got the disease will come forward for a test. And thirdly, because we, as a nation, don't tend to snitch on our friends. And unless you have pretty much 100% coverage of the testing and the tracing, the actual system itself can't work. But really the system can't work because the virus itself is not that sort of virus. One of the arguments that's, uh, that's brought forward for uh, the effectiveness of test and trace has been Australia and New Zealand and some of the Asian countries. But that assumes that their populations start from the same basis with regard to COVID as our population did. One of the other contended features of the, of the COVID uh, epidemic has been the extent to which people have got pre-existing immunity to this virus. Now, it was claimed at the beginning that because it was a new virus, there was no pre-existing immunity at all. And yet we know that in a normal winter, one in six colds are caused by coronaviruses in, in the West. So that means that these viruses are similar enough to COVID to be called coronaviruses and yet different enough to be identified as a different species. It's quite likely, therefore, that our immune response to one will at least to some extent overlap with our immune response to the other and therefore give us resistance to that. Now, when people have been looking at immunity to COVID, the test that has tended to be done because it's the easiest one to do is to see whether people have got antibodies. Now it's quite possible that in the Far East, which is where these viruses seem to originate, these viruses originate more frequently than we're aware of and that more people have more pre-existing immunity to other coronaviruses but also to this one. In which case the explanation 
for the, the apparent success of test and trace in places like Australia and New Zealand isn't particularly to do with the test and trace. It's because their populations were starting from a different baseline with regard to pre-existing immunity than our population was. Once the government decided to go down the route of lockdowns to control COVID, uh, a question for them became, how can you make people comply with these extraordinary measures that they've been introducing? And the government have actually made up a committee to do this, and they call the committee the Behavioural Insight Team, or BIT. And that's really a euphemism for how you can manipulate people into doing what you want them to do. Um, and the way in which the government has mainly used to manipulate people into complying with the measures introduced is fear, unfortunately. People have been made to be very afraid of COVID and that's been done in many, many different ways through the media continuously over the last uh, year. Now, one of the main approaches to dealing with COVID and one of the reasons why we were told that it was worth staying locked down for as long as we have been is that we give time for a vaccine to be developed. And when the vaccine was to be developed, that would control uh, yeah, that would give us immunity to COVID, control the infection and allow us an exit strategy from COVID. And yet now the vaccine has been introduced in the UK and it's one of the most successful vaccination programmes, the most successful vaccination programme almost anywhere in the world, um, and that all the vulnerable groups of people have now been protected from COVID, suddenly the goalposts have been moved to tell us that in fact it may not be true, it may not be protecting us from COVID and we may still need to be locked down for reasons that are not clear. One of the reasons perhaps they're doing this is to put pressure on younger people to get the vaccine because they are perhaps more resistant to getting the vaccine than the older people are. And another way in which the fear has been ramped up is to tell people that uh, the, the mutant variants of COVID are arising left, right and centre and these may be less susceptible to being controlled by the vaccine. Well, there's really no scientific evidence for this at all. If we could take a snapshot of viruses in the world right now, of the COVID virus in the world, we would see thousands or millions or tens of millions of different variants of COVID because that's what viruses do, they mutate and they vary. But the centre of gravity of COVID is pretty much where it is. These mutations only cause changes of a few percent in the viral genome, if, if that. So the likelihood is that these variants will all be covered by the vaccine and that the vaccine will work really well for all of them. And in fact, as you've probably already become aware, many of these so-called variants that were going to be highly infectious and spread throughout the world and affect the vaccination programme have come and gone and nothing has happened. That's because these aren't really a risk to our exit from lockdown. They're a way in which the government tries to manipulate people's behaviour by keeping you frightened of COVID so you should do what they tell you to do. Now, in my opinion, that really isn't a grown-up or even an ethical way to treat a population. It seems to me that the government doesn't want to take responsibility for lifting the measures. They're too worried that the sky might still fall. But the sky is not going to fall. The whole purpose of developing a vaccine, which has been a really great scientific success story, and then deploying it into the population, is that vaccination is one of medicine's most significant and successful ever intervention. The fact is the government have to believe in the success of their own vaccination programme. They have to believe the obvious truth that in fact one dose of the vaccines that have been deployed have been highly effective in reducing serious infections and deaths from COVID. And that allows them if nothing else, to put evidence out there to people, to allow people to make their own decisions about whether they should wear masks in pubs, about whether they should socially distance, about what they should do. What the government should no longer be doing is coercing people into, into measures which are not only of, of debatable effectiveness, even at the height of the epidemic, but that are not even necessary now. One of the really striking things about the response to COVID around the world has been the way in which uh, many, many countries have had the same response to what's been happening. The reason it seems to me why uh, everybody's doing it is in the case of developed countries, people in power, the people who are being asked to advise governments about these things, have got the same model in their heads about what's happening. And in science we call that a paradigm. And basically what happens is a paradigm holds sway and then as new evidence becomes available, uh, the paradigm eventually changes and people change the way that they look at the world. Well, with COVID, the models that are paradigmatic are the same the world over because they're all going to the same meetings, they're all thinking about things in the same way. So when governments ask their advisors what they should do, they all come up with the same answers. And of course, countries which aren't developed and don't have such strong scientific backgrounds tend to copy the other countries which are well developed. So the fact that everybody's been doing the same thing during this COVID period does not prove that it's the right thing to, to do. Some people think that 
Aiming for zero COVID is what we should be doing. In other words, we should eliminate COVID from the world. They seem to think that's possible. I think there are very clear reasons why it's an impossible dream and why we shouldn't be devoting effort to a zero COVID world. And to understand why this is the case, you have to look at the only example of a human viral disease that's ever been eliminated, and that's smallpox. Now, why isn't it possible for COVID to be eliminated in the same way? Well, first of all, COVID is not a clinically diagnosable disease. You don't come out in spots, for example, with COVID like you do with, with smallpox. The, the symptoms overlap with other respiratory diseases. So you can only identify COVID with tests. And that means that you'll miss some of the COVID cases because you'll get false negative tests, which will miss people who've got COVID, but who test negative on the test. Also, COVID is not easily isolatable. It spreads on the wind. So that means it spreads much more easily between people than smallpox did, which means it's much harder to isolate the disease. And thirdly, it's perfectly clear that there are, in fact, animal reservoirs of COVID. So we know that cats and dogs and apparently lions and a kangaroo or something in an Australian zoo can capture COVID. So for all those reasons, COVID is not going to be an eliminatable disease. And the usual way in which these viruses go is that they become less virulent with time because the less virulent versions of a virus, if you like, spread more easily amongst the population. Because they don't make us very ill, we keep walking around with them, we spread them to more people, and they become the dominant way in which people in the population get immunity to that virus. So in fact, lockdowns could be counterproductive in that setting. They actually stop us spreading the less virulent forms around, and they allow us to concentrate the nastier forms in hospitals, where we concentrate all the patients who then give them to other patients. So actually, our response to uh, COVID is, is dysfunctional, but the idea of a zero COVID world is just an impossible dream. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. I think it's fascinating that at the beginning of that clip, Boris Johnson hit on the nub of why this is such a difficult thing to manage without understanding what he was saying. He said it's an invisible threat. And the fact that it's an invisible threat has, has been essentially what's defined the nature of our response to it uh, ever since. He also pointed out that the only purpose of lockdown, the only justified purpose of lockdown at the beginning of this whole period was to protect the NHS from being overwhelmed and was to delay the peak of the epidemic so that in fact the peak became more spread out. The idea wasn't that actually fewer people would die of coronavirus, it was just that they would be affected by it over a longer period and therefore it would allow the health service more time to respond to the threat and to actually deal with it more effectively. And over the year that's morphed into other objectives such as for example zero Covid. So I think the government has actually forgotten many of their own messages from earlier in the epidemic and the import of what they were saying and why they thought it was important for us to have lockdown. The government is guilty of a lot of muddled thinking on Covid in many different ways. So they've rolled out a very successful vaccination programme. They admit that a zero Covid world is not possible and yet many of their actions still seem to be heading down the route of trying to achieve the unachievable zero Covid world. They, for example, have seen how effective the vaccine is and yet they still insist on progressing with a bi-weekly testing regime, which was a scheme that was first thought up last year at the height of the epidemic, but is now no longer necessary. It seems to me that the government are so wedded to the advice they've been getting on worst case scenario planning, they can't simply see that the sun is shining outside and it's time to move on. I think the Prime Minister and his cabinet have placed themselves in a very difficult position by the way they've approached the uncertainty which COVID has caused. The fact is there's a lot of good, sensible academic thinking on how to deal with uncertainty. And the way you should do that is not to allow one narrow group of people give you all your advice. What you should do as a politician is widen up the debate so you get as wide a range of sensible, thoughtful opinion as you can possibly get. And then as a politician, your job is to integrate that opinion and decide what the best way of going ahead is. Unfortunately, what governments around the world have done is focus their attention on a narrow group of people who are wedded to a particular version 
of the way in which viruses spread and the way in which one should deal, control a viral epidemic. And they've shut out other voices which are just as educated, just as thoughtful, just as sensible about different ways in which the epidemic could be uh, managed. And in doing that, they've made their own jobs that much harder because now that the time has come to release the restrictions that have been placed on all our lives, they're still getting their main advice from people whose job is to give them worst case scenario planning, not real world where we are now planning. In my own profession of medicine, I've been surprised really by how few people have spoken up about what's been done in response to COVID and the harms that that have been causing. Um, and it's not actually from my personal experience that people don't actually have serious reservations about what's been being done. Uh, it's really because they're worried about their jobs, to put it bluntly. Only one narrative has been allowed, and that isn't the way that science normally works. Science is normally a fairly rambunctious type of process whereby scientists with different views and with different data argue vigorously about what those data actually mean. This last year, we've been presented on the basis of very slim data with a new factual view of the world, as we're told, and we're not allowed to debate it. Well, that is not good science, it's not good medicine, and it's not good management. What the last year has really shocked me to the core about is that in the face of an invisible, apparently serious threat, rational discussion went out of the window. And that has not just affected our ability to deal with COVID sensibly, but it's actually also caused a number of collateral harms, or many collateral harms, to all sorts and aspects of our lives, which really we should have been able to avoid had we been able to act in a rational way. And when we look back on the COVID era, I think it will be seen as other human responses to invisible threats in the past have been seen as a time of mass hysteria. There were some reasons for being worried, but if we dealt with this rationally, those reasons would have been able to be managed in a way much less intrusive and much less damaging than we've done. I mean, the, the shocking thing really is that when we look back, 2020 will be about eight or 10th out of the last 30 years in terms of death rates. The quality of life effects have been dramatic, but they're quite hard to measure. So they'll be difficult to look back on and assess properly as well. But I think what we'll look back on it really is as a period of missed opportunities. When we had the opportunity to deal with a genuine new threat in a sensible, rational, scientific way, but we actually dealt with it in a rather primitive, emotional and non-scientific way, and in so doing caused huge additional harms which could have been avoided. I hope that when people look back on the COVID epidemic time and what they've learnt, one of the things that they will have learnt will be to question numbers that are coming out of government more closely, to pay more attention to what the reality is rather than what they're being told the reality is. And I also hope that we'll be able to mend the dysfunctional relationship that we currently have between politics and science. The way that the government has interacted with scientific opinion to translate it into political action during this year has not worked properly in my opinion. It's actually caused harms and it hasn't dealt effectively with the threat that we were facing. So we need to look at that in some detail and come up with better ways of dealing with it. And clearly one better way to deal with it is to understand how science normally works. Science normally works by debate and contention and shutting down debate and contention is not a way to arrive at the truth. So optimistically, I hope that going forward, we'll be able to learn these lessons and that we'll be able to do much better next time. And certainly one of the elements that should involve next time is that unless we are really faced with an overwhelming threat, we should never coerce people. We should let, treat people like grown-ups. We should let them make their own risk-benefit assessments and we should let people live their own lives.